بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته um, First of all, I would like to thank the Islamic Forum for so graciously inviting me um, to share with you some reflections from the Risale Noor. Now, just a little bit of context. Um, the Risale Noor is a contemporary Quranic tafsir um, that was written by Badi Uz Zaman Said Nursi. He was born in 1877 in Eastern Turkey and he passed away in 1960. And his rationale for writing the Risale Noor is to address some of the challenges that, um, you know, were, that were discussed this morning, particularly around that context change over time. Um, challenges change, as uh, Sheikh Jasser was saying, institutions change, systems of governance change, economic policies and models change. And he was saying in the present time, when the issues of reason and intellect and science are so high on the agenda of modern man, it's important to write a Quranic tafsir that begins to challenge these issues and address them in a substantive way, but drawing its, its inspiration directly from the Quran. And as a young man in Eastern Turkey, one of his greatest challenges was the fact that there were so many commentaries about commentaries that nobody was in fact going back to the source, which is the Quran. So that just as a, as a brief introduction to, to the Risale Nur. Now, Ustad Badiou Zaman Said Nursi, you know, tells us that there are three great and universal things that make known to us our Rob, our sustainer. The first one is the book of the universe, as uh, Sheikh Jasir was saying, both those aspects that are seen and unseen in the universe, the seal of the prophets, alayhi salatu wasalam, and the Quran of mighty stature. Now, why the book of the universe? If we consider the book of Revelation, the book of Wahi, in fact, the book of Revelation explains the book of the universe, the book of creation. If we look at the surahs in the Quran, as alluded to by Sheikh Jasser earlier on, there are a range of themes and issues that Allah Jalla Jalaluhu in fact discusses in the Quran. So we have a discussion on sand dunes. We have discussion on the ants, on the bees, on the stars, on cattle, on the cow. All the realities in the universe that the Quran of inspiration, or of revelation explains. So, so we have, Ustad Badiou Zaman says, we have a Quran of, of revelation, and we have a Quran of creation. And that the Quran of revelation explains the Quran of creation. Now, this is an important intersection between the two books. And why the seal of the Prophet ﷺ is important because he embodied ﷺ, the Quran. So it is important for us that we consider these three aspects, the book of the universe, the seal of the prophets wasalam, and the Quran of mighty stature. And we then understand if we look at these three elements, it in fact constitutes la ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. Because who other than Allah Jalla Jalaluhu could create the universe? Allah Jalla Jalaluhu sent his messenger with the Sharia to us as mankind. And as Sheikh Justice said earlier on, the Quran of mighty stature is the Kalamullah, is the speech of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. And what is very important for us to consider and to reflect on, and, and, the, and there's an issue that I'd like for you to, 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 to consider and, and ponder, is that as there's a Sharia in the Quran of revelation, so there's a Sharia in the Quran of creation. The question is, the question for consideration is, how is it that we are so able and easily contest and in fact defy the Sharia of the Quran, and yet we submit unquestioningly to the, the Sharia in, in, in 
the book of the universe. Think about, you know, you can go to the top of a building and you can stand there and say, I'm going to defy the law of gravity and I'm going to jump down here. Would, that, would we even ever consider that? Or there's a fire burning, I'm going to put my hand into this fire and I'm going to contest this law of nature. Because remember, there are come in the Quran and there are come also in the universe. But why is it that as human beings, we are so able and, and so willing almost and act with, act with volition that we can contest and defy the ahkam from the Quran. So I want us to reflect on that. Now, the issue on, if we think about these three aspects that our sustainer, our Rabb, wants to make himself known to us. Okay. What is the natural consequence of knowing him? Is loving him. So when we claim that we love Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, in fact what we are saying is that we know him. Because consider the fact that we can only love that which we know. If somebody gives you a fruit that you have never seen before, have never tasted before, is it not quite absurd to say, I love this fruit? But if you have a particular affinity for an orange, and somebody gives you an orange, you can say, I love this orange, because you have knowledge of it. So we must think very carefully when we talk about, you know, we talk about muhabbatullah, a precursor to that is ma'rifatullah. Because we can only love that which we know. And Allah Jalla Jalalu have given us these three great and universal things by which to know Him and therefore by which to love Him. Now, this conceptualization in fact then brings us to two injunctions. The one is Ikra, read, and the other one is Tafakkur, reflect. These are not nice to haves. These are, in fact, injunctions from the Qur'an. So we talk about the idea of the Ahlul Kitab, and we have a particular conception of what that means. But in fact, Ustad Badiou Zaman Sa'id Nursi says to us, we are, or ought to be, the Ahlul Kitab. The people who read the book of Revelation, and the people who read and study and follow the example of his Rasul والسلام, who embodied the Qur'an and we are also the ones who should read the book of the universe because we know that in the Qur'an of mighty stature Allah Jalla Jalalu has ayats in the Qur'an and we know that the ayat is not, um, is not correctly translated as verses they are in fact signs. So what do signs typically do? Signs give us information, they give us warnings, and they give us direction. So the signs, the ayat in the Quran of revelation, and the ayat in the, in the Quran of creation, or the Quran of the universe, those ayats are what are constituted in nature. The birds, the bees, the mountains, the animals, the plants, the flowers. These are the ayats which give us information about our Creator and it points us to Him. So we understand that the ayats in, in the universe are not self-referential. They are other-referential. They do not show themselves, but they show us who our Creator is. It shows, it shows us the, the power of our Creator, and it also shows us the, the beauty of our Creator. So we must understand that earlier on there was a question about you know, being criticized, that we are not Mufassirs and we are not allowed um, to, to have halkas and to have Quranic tafsir. In fact, a fakur is incumbent on every single human being, regardless of age, regardless of gender. This is an incumbent responsibility on all of us. And I really want to, to reiterate and support what uh, Sheikh Jasser had said, is that this in, is an incumbent duty. This is not something, this is not a delegated responsibility that we can delegate to the ulama or to our elders 
or to people who we consider to be learned. This is an incumbent responsibility on each one of us. Because so many of the ayat in the Quran refers to people with intellect, people who think, people who reflect. So clearly, this is not meant for a particular class or a particular group of elite people. It's an incumbent duty on all of us. Now, what is the Quran and, and how is it defined? As we've said that the, the Quran is the translator of the mighty book of the universe, it contains both cosmological and theological realities, both of which we have to engage with. Um, it is also the instructor of the world of humanity. It is the true guide and leader urging humanity to prosperity and happiness. So clearly, we can see if we consider that the Quran is, is urging mankind to development, it clearly shows it was never meant to be a static message caught up in a particular historical moment. It is meant to evolve, it is meant to develop, it is meant to be elevated. So this issue of urging mankind is an important issue that we have to consider all of us. It is a book of law, it is a book of prayer, it is a book of wisdom, it is a book of worship, it is a book of command and summons, it is a book of invocation, and it is a book of thought. So if we consider the multiplicity of the Quran, and I want to reflect on something very fundamental and important that uh, Sheikh Jasser in fact mentioned in, in his introduction last night. We somehow have misrepresented the idea of hafiz and we have erroneously um, alluded to it as memorization of the Quran. It is, as Sheikh Jasser said, about preservation. Now, if we consider preservation, if we think about very rare manuscripts that reside in, in archives all over the world, there's a particular science that regulates that kind of regulation, of that kind of, of, of um, preservation. It must be kept at a certain temperature, certain levels of humidity, certain levels of light, etc. So if the science of preservation around material substances is at such an advanced level, how much more should we be cognizant and mindful about the preservation of the Quran? Because if we consider that it is a book of law, of prayer, of wisdom, of thought, of command, of invocation, so, the, so there are books within these books, with, within the Quran. And what this shows us very clearly is that every single of our faculties need to have its own share of the Quran. But if we relegate the Quran only to our memory, what happens to our heart? What happens to our ruh? What happens to our imagination, our intuition, our emotions? Because if you look at the indices of what the Quran actually is, it really speaks to being the medial to all the different faculties, not just the mind. But if we continue to insist that memorization of the Quran is the highest attainment and achievement in terms of our engagement with the Quran, we are in fact being quite one-dimensional. And we are not allowing the, our other faculties, both our gross faculties and our subtle faculties, to have its requisite share of the Quran. The characteristics of the Quran, Ustad Badiuzaman says, is that very importantly, it sees reality as it is. Okay? Because there's something, there's a difference between what is apparent and what is real. Because often what is apparent is not actually what is real. Okay? The Quran is also familiar with the unseen. Okay? The Quran bestows guidance and it shows truth, haq. Consider the Quran's comprehensiveness. 
The, the ayat in the Quran denotes all categories of speech, true knowledge, and human needs. And there are some indices around this. It contains command and prohibition. It, in, it um, encourages and deters. It offers restraint and guidance. It includes stories and comparisons, as, as Sir Joseph alluded to earlier on when he was discussing the thematic nature of the Quran. It contains both divine ordinances and teachings. It contains sciences related to the universe. And as we know, and as Sir Joseph was saying earlier on too, these sciences are constantly, in a sense, um, in computer terms, being upgraded. New knowledge replaces old knowledge quite quickly. And there almost seems in, in the advancement of science today to be an acceleration in the kinds of discoveries, well, they're not actually discoveries, they're uncoverings of realities that already exist in the universe. Mankind merely uncovers those kinds of things. So they're no real new discoveries, they're only uncoverings of what hitherto may have been hidden. The Quran also denotes through its ayats the laws and conditions of both personal and social life. And it denotes knowledge and needs that we have as human beings and guides the life of the heart, our spiritual life, and the life of the year after. Now, Ustad Baduzaman says that there are four fundamental aims and elements of the Quran. The first one is divine unity, Tawheed. The second one is prophethood, Nubuwa. The third one is resurrection, Hashr. And the fourth one is justice, Adalat. Now, he contends that these four aims, divine unity, prophethood, resurrection, and justice, these four aims permeate not only the entire Quran, but in fact, the four aims are manifested in every single surah of the Quran. And he issues a challenge to us and he says, consider and reflect on the shortest surah in the Quran and try and find the manifestation of these four elements. Surah Al-Kawthar. Look at that, reflect on it, and find these four manifestations of these four elements. And that is often one of the methodological tools that Ustad Badiuzaman uses in the Risale Nur, in his tafsir, is that he is true to Allah Jalla Jalalu's injunction around reflect, and he would often conclude a piece of text by saying, I've given you one example, now you consider your own. Or he uses the Socratic method of questioning and he says, for example, we must never be afraid to question because that the, the, the prohibition on questioning is what makes us complacent. Because he also confers to us the fact that the purpose of us being in the universe is to know Allah, to love Him, and through that process to strengthen and to increase our own Iman. But if we do not question, if we do not doubt, how can we reach certainty? So I think this is important particularly for us as women and for us as young people that we must never be afraid. And as Sir Jata said, he, he, he made a very important and succinct point where he said that the purpose of questioning should be to understand not for the purpose of critique and to challenge and to denigrate. That's then not the purpose because that then is quite counterproductive. The purpose of questioning is to understand because we know that part of our engagement with the Quran is that we need to internalize the teachings of the Quran, its wisdom and its guidance. That internalization should then transform into a process of transformation 
And that transformation should then shape our actions and our behavior. Okay? So the internalization, transformation, and action is an important continuum and objective of our engagement with the Quran. Now, I just wanted to perhaps present a prism of understanding. You know, when we engage with reality, when we engage in the universe, it's always useful to consider these three, three realms or three dimensions. There's the outer, there's the inward, and then there's, then there's the hidden. Now, the outer deals with things at the level of, of what is social or political or relational. The inward considers characteristics, emotions, virtues, and in fact characterizes our state of being. And the hidden, in fact, delves into the unseen and divine determining qadr. That's important for us to look. So this prism, in fact, should be almost a conceptual framework by which we engage with people, with events, and with issues. That we understand that there are these dimensions of reality and that we should be able to engage with all of them. Similarly, Ustad Budu Zaman is saying in the Quran, it's exactly the same. It has its outer aspect, its inward aspect, and its hidden aspect. Now, he talks about this issue of the spheres of life. And if we look at this diagram, in fact, it is a microcosm of each of our individual worlds. And he conceives of life as a series of concentric circles. And why is this important? He locates the heart and the stomach in the center. And I will leave this with you. Why did he conceptualize of both the heart and the stomach? Because it kind of seems almost counterintuitive for the heart and the stomach to be in the smaller circle. But that is for your tafakkur. Um, he's located the heart and stomach in the center. The next circle is our home and our body, then our neighborhood and our town, our country and our land, the globe and mankind, and animate beings and the world. Now he says that there's almost an inverse relationship at play in, the sp in these spheres of life. And remember, each one of us owns this in our individual world. The most important and permanent of our duties are located in the smaller spheres. The most important and permanent of our duties are located in the smaller spheres. However, the larger spheres are very attractive. The larger spheres are attractive and therefore distract us often from engaging with the inner, with the inner spheres or the smaller spheres. Now, what is the sense of permanence? Ustad Baduzaman says that our most important and permanent duties are located in the smaller spheres. Is that we know that we live a transient existence in this life and in this world. And that, inshallah, we all go to the year after and enter into eternal happiness and eternal bliss. Now, the things that we do in this world, in order for it to have permanence, means that those are the things that are going to be beneficial for us in the life of the year after. And how we can use this as a conceptual framework to shape and regulate our life and our interactions is that if we consider for ourselves how much time am I spending, not only how much time, but how much energy and how much resources am I in fact allocating to these different spheres? And this is a very, very personal exercise because this is in fact a snapshot of each of our individual worlds. So when we want to engage in things, we must always consider how much time I'm allocating to this and 
how much effort am I putting in? How many resources? And it's not, it's not just about money. Do I, in fact, attach to this? And is it going to assist me in the permanence of my life in the year after? If the answer is no, one would therefore be a little bit hesitant about giving that kind of attention and input to those kinds of activities. So Stalpa Duizaman says that the, the most important and permanent of our duties are the smaller sphere. Now, if we look at this diagram and if we think about the, the modern, um, the contemporary models of theories of change, we're very, if we're looking at systems theories, we're looking at root cause analysis, for example, this is very much the, the kind of thinking um, in, in an Islamic context that, um, that we should be very mindful of. And then I thought I just wanted to, to you know, give a quote that Ustad Badi Uzaman says in the words, which is one of the, the, the books in the Risali Nur collection. He says, life's capital is very little and the work to be done is much. Now, last night also in the introduction, Sheikh Jasser um, also alluded to a very important point when he said, that the stories of the prophets, the stories of the Anbiya contained in the Quran are not mere historical narratives. And it is important that we must consider that they have a resonance that transcends time and they resonate in our own personal life and in our own personal world. So that even when we are transmitting the stories of the prophets to our children, we must, at the same time, alert them to the fact that these are not just interesting stories, but Allah Jalla Jalaluhu in his wisdom and in his knowledge had included them in the Quran in order for us to engage with it. Now, I thought that it would be useful, just as an example, um, and to give you a taste of what the Risali Nur is like and the kinds of issues that Ustad Badi Zaman discusses in his tafsir is to look at the dua of Nabi Yunus alayhi salam. And I, I think that we, all of us, pretty much know um, the story. And he says that the dua of Nabi Yunus alayhi salam, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu mina dhalimin. He says that this is a very, very powerful dua. And remember earlier on, he had made the point that the Quran is a, is a book of wisdom, it's a book of guidance, it's a book of thought, it is a book of prayer, it's a book of invocation. And here we can see through his tafsir of this ayah, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu mina dhalimin, that he says that it is the most effective means for us to obtain answer to our dua. So in giving the tafsir, he's also giving us guidance and he's also giving us um, a key to unlock the sincerity of our duas and to, in a sense, enhance the, the strength and the power of our own duas. Now the gist of the story of Nabi Yunus alayhi salam is that he was cast into the sea and he was swallowed by a large fish. The sea was stormy, the night was turbulent and dark, and his hope was exhausted. And his dua, la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu mina dhalimeen, the translation of which is, there is no God other than you, glory be unto you, indeed I was among the wrongdoers. In fact, was the means to the salvation of Nabi Yunus alayhi salam. If we consider our situation, Ustad Badiuzaman draws our attention to the fact that our night, and remember we talked about the resonance that transcends time and particularity and context, and also the resonance that we need to in fact see and feel in our own lives. Now, our night, Ustad Badu Zaman says, is the future. And if we look at the future through the eyes of misguidance, our night is a hundred times darker 
and more fearful than the night of Nabi Yunus alayhi salam. Our sea is this spinning globe and he says that each wave of this sea bears upon itself hundreds of corpses. Think about if, if we imagine the number of people who pass away globally every day. Even just within our own families, and our own circles, we understand that death, as the Quran tells us, death is a reality and it will affect us because it is absolutely inevitable. Um, and it will also affect those around us. So we understand this reality that our sea is the spinning globe and our fish is the caprice of our nafs, which strives to shake and destroy the foundation of our eternal life. So we can see here that what may have been an interesting story takes on a very different reality when we transpose that story and we, in a, in a sense, superimpose it on our own situation in, in, a, in, in, a, in a different context. And what is interesting is that Ustad Badiou Zaman says that the, the fish of Nabi, of Nabi Yunus alayhi salam could destroy a hundred year lifespan, okay? Whereas ours, our nafs, can seek to destroy a life lasting hundreds of millions of years. Okay? Now what we, what we draw from this there are, there are certain elements, and, and, and what Ustad Badiou Zaman calls the knowledge of certainty, is that we know in these three aspects, the future, the world, and our nafs, our soul, that the future is subject to Allah's command, the world is subject to Allah's jurisdiction, and that our nafs, our soul, is subject to His direction. So if we look at Nabi Yunus alayhi salam, there was the sea, there was the night, there was the darkness, he had lost all hope for salvation, and, and there was the fish or the whale, and he understood that in order for him to be saved, the one under whose guidance and command all those things were, were the, was the only being that could in fact save him. The one who commanded the fish, the sea, the night, and, and, and his own nafs. That was the only being, Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, who could then in fact save him from the situation. So similarly, if we look at our situation and what all these metaphors in fact now mean in our current reality, we must certainly in the same way have this knowledge of certainty that our future is subject to Allah's command, that our world is subject to his jurisdiction, and also that our nafs is subject to his direction. And then when we're finding resonance within our own world, with the phrase, there is no God but you, we draw Allah Jalla Jalaluhu's gaze of mercy upon our future. With the phrase, glory be unto you, we draw his gaze upon our world. And with the phrase, indeed I was among the wrongdoers, we draw it upon our own soul. And what does this constitute? We find the Quranic roadmap through this phrase, la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu minna dhalimin. So the, the Quran shows us then the road map about how to navigate our life and existence in this world where we consider the future, our current world, our situation now and also our nafs which is our inward. So I hope you, you'll be able to see how these conceptual frameworks all become superimposed in terms of the dimensions of, of, of reality, 
the spheres of, of life and existence, we all superimpose that, as Sheikh Jassir was saying, and we apply the Quranic concepts to the reality and not the other way around. So when we look to the future, what we need to do then is we must understand that if we illuminate our future with the light of Iman and the luminosity of the Quran, then the darkness and the uncertainty of the future um, will not be as grave. Um, if we look at our earthly abode, yeah. when we look at our earthly abode, we need to navigate this earthly abode. And, and here Ustad Badiou Zaman uses a, um, a metaphor of the sea, and he says that we need to travel on the ship of the truth of Islam, which is fashioned in the dockyard of the most wise Quran. And we know typically what a dockyard is used for and why Ustad Badiou has used this metaphor, because it comes in from time to time for repairs. So we also understand that there's this eternal sense of hope. It's not um, all hell and damnation, not at all. Because Allah Jalla Jalaluhu is our creator, he's our owner, he's our sustainer, and he knows that we will err. So then Mustafa Badu Zaman uses the, the metaphor of the dockyard to draw our attention to the fact that yes, we will err, but we can go back and continuously in our engagement with the Qur'an, repair whatever needs to be repaired, and then off we go again. And in terms of our own nafs, he says that the effect of that criterion of truth and falsehood, the Qur'an, if we engage with it in a substantive way, it means that our nafs will no longer ride us, but it will in fact become a mount for us. Okay? Now, the, the criterion of truth and falsehood clearly points us to the fact that an important aspect of what the Qur'an teaches us is the ability to discern. The issue of Furqan is an important aspect because so much of what happens in the world today is that we are no longer exercising our ability to discern. Whether it is through social media, or whether it is just through imitation, we're no longer saying, what do I think about this? What is my view? So the next time we retweet something, give it a little bit of thought and say, is this something I really believe? Or am I saying this because this is the popular worldview at the moment? And what then finally is our duty? Our duty is because remember we started off by saying that there are three things three great and universal things that make known to us our sustainer. It's the book of the universe, it is the, the seal of the Prophet Rasulullah and it is the Quran of mighty stature. So what then is our duty given that Allah Jalla Jalalu have given us these three universal things by which to know and love him? We, our responsibility is to cleanse our heart, it is to purify our soul, it is to advance our ruh and to perfect our mind. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alamtana inna ka anta al-alimul hakeem wa akhiru da'wahum alilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Shazakallah Razina for the wonderful talk. Um, I think we have about three minutes for questions if anyone has. I'll be here throughout the weekend oh, okay. if people also want to ask additional questions. <laughs> well, yeah. Sister so, Nazima says she'll be here throughout the weekend if anyone wants to ask questions privately. But if there aren't any questions now, oh, there we go. Yeah, sure. No, there are very few things that I don't have thoughts on. <laughs> um, I think this is one of the, 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 the challenges that Sheikh uh, Jason and I, in fact, were chatting about earlier on. Um, yes, it is true that Fethullah Gulen um, had started off um, in his earlier years reading the Risal Nur. 
Um, and what has happened over time that he has completely diverged, diverged from the way of the Risali move. So it has kind of almost evolved into a pragmatic thing where the Risali Nur is now was used to legitimize a particular political and ideological agenda. So therefore for us it's very important that we, we stick to the text um, of the Risali Nur and we have never followed the path of divergence that Fethullah Gulen, unfortunately, um, in his own wisdom, has, has followed. But it certainly has cast um, quite a shadow you know, on, on the Risali Nur at this time. And I'm very glad that you've raised that because some people may have some uncertainties about the validity um, of the Risali Nur, given that one of its um, supposed proponents or readers have certainly diverged in the way that it is said that he has. Yeah, the, the book of the universe basically encapsulates everything in creation. Because we know that the Quran is, is the Kalamullah, it's Allah's speech. The book of the universe manifests his names and his attributes in the universe. Okay? So think about, for example, um, Allah's name of, of Al Hafid, the, the preserver. And think about when a seed is planted in the earth. Okay? There's a process by which the seed eventually will become a fruit. That, that the, 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 the future life of the following seed uh, of the next uh, plant is in fact preserved in the seed that comes out of the fruit which was then the outcome of that long process. So the book of the universe looks at creation both in its, in its manifest way and also in the way of the unseen. So we, we then consider that the, the ayat in the book of the universe are, as I had said, the, the creation of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, which then points us to him as our creator and our sustainer. Are there any more questions?